One of the most remembered and important legacies of the 100 Years' War was the heroine Joan of Arc. Being just a teenager, she managed to lead the French army to victory at the Siege of Orléans. She's considered today as one of the nine secondary patron saints of France and was declared a martyr following her death. Her story is incredibly interesting, but what happened to her at the hands of the English was truly barbaric. Join us today as we look at the brutal execution of Joan of Arc, the maid of Orléans. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. The Hundred Years' War was a conflict between England and France, which began in 1337 due to disputes about who was the rightful heir to the French throne. At the start of the wars, the English were winning the majority of the battles, and had nearly achieved their goal of ruling with a dual monarchy over England and France. The country had been ravished in the mid-14th century by the Black Death, and the population of France had not managed to catch up. When Joan of Arc was born, Charles VI was the French king, and he was often unable to rule, due to bouts of insanity which he suffered from. In 1420, the Queen of France granted the wish which Henry V of England wanted following his famous victory at the Battle of Agincourt. She left the French throne to the King of England Henry V and his heirs rather than to her own son. Henry V died in 1422 along with the French King and Henry's son Henry VI became the King of England and also the King of France. However, there was a problem as Henry VI was only an infant at the time and his uncle John of Lancaster would have to act as regent. Joan of Arc was the daughter of Jacques de Arc and Isabel Romay, and they lived in Don Remy, and Joan's parents owned around 50 acres of land, with her father working as a farmer and also a tax collector in a local area. They lived in an area of France that still was at the time loyal to the French king, and during her childhood she saw raids occurring in her village, to the point that her village was burned to the ground in one of these. It was considered that Joan could not read or write, she was born around 1412, and it was clear that at a young age, she was a very different child. She would later state that around the age of 13, she had her first vision, and it was these that would make her famous. She claimed that in her father's garden, she had visions of St. Michael, St. Catherine and St. Margaret. During these visitations, she claimed that the saints had told her to force the English out of France and take the Dauphin of France to his consecration. Joan was very emotional following this episode and she claimed that the saints were so beautiful. At 16, she asked a close relative to take her to a nearby town and whilst here she asked the commander of the local garrison for an armed escort to take her to the French royal court. The commander obviously was taken aback by this and initially refused but she later returned again and asked a few months later. She did manage to gain the support of two of the commander's soldiers. Following this, she was given a second meeting with the commander and she made a prediction that there would be a reversal of the French fortunes at a battle near to Orléans. This prediction was made days before the messengers arrived to report that this had actually occurred. So Joan's prediction was considered to be true and following this, she was considered to be a rather divine figure. This revelation managed to persuade the commander, Robert de Baudricourt, to take Joan to visit the royal court. Joan travelled with the commander and her escort through hostile territory and she was disguised at the time as a male soldier. Later on she would be charged with cross-dressing, but her escort deemed it to be a good precaution to take for the young girl. Joan first met with the Dauphin Charles at the royal court in Chinon in 1429 when she was 17. When she arrived, she made a good impression on Charles when speaking in private and Joan asked for permission to accompany the army and wear armour given to her by the French crown. The royalty saw her as a rather interesting concept and for a while France had been suffering during the 100 years war, so the crown would have seen it as unorthodox and a risk, but everything they had tried before had failed. But Joan was considered a risk to the Dauphin, with the fact his critics could consider her to be a heretic or even a witch. She began to in a sense turn the conflict between England and France into a religious war due to her visions and the fact she had been visited by the saints to expel the English from France. To protect himself and also Joan, Dauphin Charles ordered an inspection of Joan to investigate her morals and personality. In April 1429, 
the inquiry stated that she was of irreproachable life, a good Christian, and possessed the virtues of humility, honesty and simplicity. This therefore informed Charles' decision to use Joan in a military capacity. It was said that to doubt or abandon her without suspicion of evil would repudiate the Holy Spirit and to become unworthy of God's aid. It was said that her claims should be put to the test to see if she could lift the siege of Orléans as she had predicted. The English and Burgundians had been besieging the town since the 12th of October 1428 and it would be here where Joan would see her first action. The city held a strategic importance to both of the sides and for around six months the English and their allies appeared to be winning and heading towards victory. But when Joan arrived things changed. Joan was given armour and a horse and her first mission was to join a convoy and bring supplies to the town. Joan intended on facing the English from the north but her commanders decided to go to the south considering her actions too risky. Joan wasn't happy and ordered an immediate attack on the nearest English Bastille. During this, one of Joan's miracles was said to have occurred when the wind which brought the boats up river suddenly changed direction, allowing the convoy to sail back to Orléans quickly and without any issue. Joan of Arc entered the town in victorious scenes on the 29th of April at around 8pm to much celebration. Over the next few days she was paraded around the streets and was seen giving out food and paying the soldiers. She also sent messengers to the English demanding their departure. Joan's arrival at Orléans changed everything in the siege as the French started to capture different fortresses and strategic locations. Over the next few days they managed to capture other targets and areas but Joan did get injured. She was hit and wounded by an arrow between her neck and shoulder while she was holding her banner. She did recover rather quickly in an act some people thought must have been a miracle and she resumed fighting. The day after the final assault was launched the English retreated and the siege of Orléans was over and Joan had done exactly what she said she would do. The lifting of the siege gave her immense support across France but to the English the ability of a peasant girl being able to defeat their army was proof that she was actually a witch or was possessed by the devil. It was believed that God was supporting the French through Joan and this was something the English were furious with. What followed next was more military success for Joan and the English in mid-June would withdraw further conceding more territory. There was even time for Charles to become consecrated as king like Joan had told him to do in July 1429. It seemed that Joan's arrival leading the army was a huge turning point and things turned in a better direction for the French. Joan was even present at the consecration standing with her banner close to the altar and after the ceremony she knelt before Charles calling him her king. After this further military campaigns occurred with the French assaulting Paris on the 8th of September. During this Joan did receive another wound from a crossbow bolt to her leg. She was carried back to safety but the assault in Paris was not successful. A brief truce was agreed with the English however in March 1430 Joan dictated a letter threatening a dissident group that broke from the Catholic Church. She warned the Hussites to remove your madness and foul superstition taking either your heresy or your lives. The truce with the English did come to an end and Joan travelled to Compignon to help defend the city against the English and Burgundian siege. On the 23rd of May she was part of a group who attempted to attack the Burgundian camp and during this she was ambushed north of the city and was captured. As her forces withdrew Joan stayed with the rear guard of the army and at that point the Burgundians surrounded them and she was pulled off her horse. She then agreed to surrender. Joan was imprisoned at Beau Rivoire Castle and during her stay she did attempt many different escape attempts and one included a jump from her 70 foot tower. Following this she was moved but the English seeing her worth negotiated with the Burgundians to transfer her over to English custody. It cost the English 10,000 livres and they moved her to the city of Rouen. Attempts were made to rescue Joan but each time these attempts were defeated and Charles VII vowed vengeance against the Burgundian soldiers who captured her. Joan was then put on trial and her trial was for heresy. The court consisted mostly of English and Burgundian officials and was overseen by English commanders. 
it was in a sense a trial to get rid of Joan and cause her maximum embarrassment. The trial began in February 1431 and Joan was denied a legal advisor which violated ecclesiastical law. England could not let Joan go free, if she was actually guided by the word of God then so was the French king. She faced a huge list of charges including wearing men's clothes, heresy and witchcraft. Nuns had been to visit her previously to examine her and the evidence gained from this was that Joan was pure. Joan at her trial put up a fight and established a very mature defence. She began to run rings around the prosecutors, for example when she was asked about the charge of wearing men's clothes, she confirmed she did this, saying, whilst in prison, the English have molested me, when I was dressed as a woman, I have done this to defend my modesty. Following this, her trial was changed to be held in private. Between February the 21st and March the 24th, she was interrogated a lot, but each time managed to keep her humility and innocence. She was held in a military prison, and was constantly threatened with torture, and Joan kept refusing to break. Growing frustrated, the tribunal decided to use her military clothes against her, and charged her with dressing like a man. On the 29th of May 1431, it was announced that Joan was guilty of heresy. On the morning of the 30th of May, her punishment and sentence would be carried out. Joan was to be executed by being burned at the stake. When Joan heard of her method of execution, she was incredibly upset and told her jailers that she would rather be beheaded. Before her death, the guards who had laughed at her previously surrounded the upset Joan. One of these took pity on the 19-year-old girl and gave her a wooden cross moments before she was due to be tied to the stake. She made her way out to the marketplace in Rouen, where a scaffold had been erected with a large stake on it. Here Jane kissed the wooden cross which she had been given. The soldiers around her surrounded her, with a crowd of around 10,000 in attendance. Joan was tied to the stake. An eyewitness that day stated, I was present at the last sermon on the day she was burned. There were three galleries of scaffolds, one where the judges sat, one where many bishops sat, and one where wood was prepared for the burning of Joan. At the end of the sermon, a sentence was pronounced, which delivered Joan to secular justice. After this sentence was pronounced, Joan began to make many pious exclamations, and amongst other things she said that nothing she had done, either good or ill, had been suggested by the king. Thereupon I left, not wishing to see the burning of Joan. I saw many bystanders weeping. The flames were lit, and whilst tied to the tall pillar, she asked two of the clergy to hold a crucifix before her, and she stared at the symbol as the flames rose higher. She prayed as the flames burned her, and she uttered the name of Jesus Christ as the flames burned her skin. Someone in the crowd tried to throw extra kindling on the fire, however was prevented in doing so. Seeing the death of the 19 year old girl who led the French must have been a horrifying sight, seeing Joan burning at the stake as the flames engulfed her. The scenes must have been distressing, and one legend exists that suggests her heart survived the fire. The English would go on to burn her body twice more to ensure it was reduced to ashes and to stop any relics being collected of her. Her remains were then thrown into a local river. The execution of Joan of Arc was at the heart of it, the execution of a 19 year old girl whose visions had brought great success for the French. The English had assumed that she was a witch or a heretic and that there was no way without some form of sorcery or intervention she could have led a victory against the English. Interestingly those who burned Joan and many who witnessed that day claimed they had burned a saint, and many feared to be eternally damned for burning a holy woman. Joan is remembered today as a patron saint of France, however at a posthumous trial after the end of the Hundred Years War, she was deemed to have been innocent. Joan of Arc's execution is an event which today is incredibly debatable and shocking, and it's important that she's remembered as an incredibly important figure in history. Once again thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.